It's a great pleasure to introduce now uh, Dan Yanko from Oregon Health Science University. Um, Dan is an assistant professor in the behavioral department of neuroscience, and he has developed some very interesting ways of adapting co-expression methods for RNA-seq data. And I thought um, he should present his methods to you, because many of you deal with RNA-seq data. So thank you, Steve, for inviting me here. Um, I'm very excited, and I feel like home, because we always we, we work on the same um, kind of concepts of integrating data and looking holistically at what goes on in a biological system. So the first, um, for a few years, I worked with microarray data. And then um, about a couple of years ago, me and my collaborators started using um, RNA-seq data. And we were talking about it. And uh, what transpired was like, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be a waste to just utilize RNA-seq data the same way we use microarrays for years now? Because, you know, RNA-seq data really gives you a lot more information, and in particular, exon-level information. Um, so, if we have exon-level information, then we can look at um, splicing. So, let's review a little bit what gene splicing um, means. So, if we have a, a gene, uh, the kind of standard way that the gene is put together during transcription and translation is just to paste uh, the constitutive axons together, and then you produce the protein. However, uh, most of the genes in the uh, human, uh, especially in the human um, and mammalian transcriptomes, uh, have variations. So an axon can be skipped, so you just produce the same gene but without that particular axon. Or you can um, keep an intron, uh, and then the intron becomes part of the protein at the end. Um, then there are more uh, variations on this theme. You can have mutually exclusive uh, axons or um, alternative uh, splice sites, and um, this is just scratching the surface. So there are many variations on producing um, a protein. Okay, so now we know from Steve's work that gene expression appears to be coordinate, a coordinated process, uh, resulting in a scale-free network structure. So the questions that I want to address today are the following. Is the production of distinct isoforms also coordinated, uh, a coordinated biological process? Also, uh, can we describe this process using the network terminology? And, um, once again, I don't know why this appears in this shape. Um, but in any case, the question is, can we uh, describe uh, coordinated um, uh, isoform production using network um, terminology? So as an example, let's look at this uh, D2 receptor gene. So if you work in neuroscience, this is a dopamine receptor, and it has like an important function in uh, striatum and even in the cortex. So it produces um, many isoforms, but in particular has a long and a short form. So these um, um, isoforms have different properties in the protein. So if you have the long one, that behaves differently than the short one. And that's an important biological event, and we want to describe that. So what do I mean by co-splicing? So let's suppose that we have one gene, and every once in a while, it skips an axon. Now you have the second gene, and some, every once in a while, um, it keeps the intron in the, in the um, isoform, in the transcript. So my working definition of gene co-splicing is I want to evaluate whether these genes um, coordinate, these two separate genes coordinate their, their isoform production. So whenever this one keeps the, uh, ax, uh, skips the axon, the other one will keep the intron or variations on this theme. And of course, we have thousands of genes in the transcriptome. Each one of them will produce possibly several isoforms. 
So what I want to do is to integrate all of this information in the WGCNA framework. Yes. So fundamentally, you're you're suggesting that these aren't the state. No, of course not. <laughs> um, yes. So how do we evaluate whether whether they are mistakes or not? So there are uh, different schools of thoughts on this. So some of them say that most um, uh, splicing is really a mistake in the in the splicing machinery. And, uh, and some other people say, no, that isoforms really provide different functions uh, and um, you know, they should be integrated in the analysis. So why do we want to analyze this in a framework, uh, in a network framework? Because if, if there are uh, splicing mistakes, then the assumption is, the normal assumption to me, is that they proceed independently for different genes. So if you have a lot of isoforms, but they are uncoordinated, then it's unlikely that they have any functional relevance. So that's one motivation for going to a network analysis. So several, um, when I embarked on this project, um, I looked around in the literature and said, is there any biological evidence that there is like coordinated splicing um, in the transcriptome? And it turns out that, yes, there's a, fairly large body of literature that says that uh, groups of genes coordinate the isoform production and you can detect this in um, disease and normal tissue and so on. Um, and they also think, uh, um, they talk about the complex splicing code. Uh, what does that mean and how can we describe that? So I said, okay, this sounds really interesting, but they were using these terms and um, to me, they, they didn't exactly explain what is the splicing code. Um, so the goal of the project, quantify, once again, quantify the level of co-splicing using network and graph theory concepts. And in cancer, so um, many changes occur in a, in a cancerous cell, but one of the most striking examples is the tumor progression it's uh, associated with a coordinated splicing control. Um, so that they, lots of people are um, interested in how this alternative splicing is coordinated or misregulated. So you have to compare um, um, healthy and um, disease tissues and see, you know, is there changes, are there changes? So one of the first things I, I did when uh, confronted with um, uh, RNA-seq data mapped to individual axons, I, I looked at the correlations between individual axons and correlations between the genes. So you see here that at the gene level, these two genes have virtually no correlation. However, you, uh, if you look at the axon level, you find like fairly large correlations here. So um, this, indicated to me that axon level, informa uh, axon level information is different from just uh, kind of compressing on putting everything under the gene expression level. So by now you're all familiar with um, gene expression level and how they are coordinated across different genes. Um, now gene splicing. The goal is to say, okay, these two genes, we start producing isoforms, coordinated manner, and how to evaluate this coordination. And uh, the goal is to integrate using WGCNA. So now we imagine that you have um, your RNA-seq data and you mapped everything to exons. So our virtual gene here, here has just like three axons. How do, you, how do you represent this data? So the simplest thing is to just say, okay, I have a three-dimensional uh, three vector, and I just record the expression level of each axon, and at the end of the day, I get this vector for one uh, isoform or axon inclusion profile, to be uh, correct. <laughs> Now you have the same gene, but 
in another sample. Once again, you just like project the vector or record for each axon the expression level, and you end up with another vector. So now, um, how do you compute the differences between these two vectors? So there are a lot of distance measures that are available to, to com um, compare multidimensional data. So the, the, maybe the most important uh, step is to choose appropriately the distance measure. So you can see, you can look at the angle between them. You can just look at the Euclidean distance, or you can choose yet another uh, distance measure. So my favorite distance um, measure is what's called the Canberra distance measure. Um, so the simplest one would be the Manhattan. So you just, um, for each axon, you go and you say, what's the absolute um, uh, level difference between the, the expression, the number of counts for this axon and for the, uh, this other axon, and you add it up for all the available axons. So this should be very similar to just uh, comparing the absolute expression levels of the gene. Um, the Canberra distance measure, it's a little bit different. So you still subtract the expression level of each axon, but you know, kind of normalize it, but the sum, the sum of the uh, counts for those axons. So for instance, uh, suppose that you didn't uh, normalize your data um, uh, using uh, RPKM or FPKM <coughs> or other available uh, normalization procedures. This will accomplish that goal. Um, even, though, even though if you did normalize the data, uh, in my experience, it doesn't make much difference. So you can use RPKMs, axon level, or you can use um, just counts. Uh, and in my experience, it didn't change much, the final results. And um, another distance measure is the cosine distance measure, which for our discussion today, we'll just imagine that it's the angle. It's related to the angle between those two vectors. So what I'm going to show you today that uh, choosing an appropriate distance measure uh, has important um, uh, effects on the analysis. So different distance measure will capture different uh, biological properties of your data. So here is just once more. Uh, how do you compute the uh, Canberra distance measure? You go axon by axon. We have three axons. You subtract the expression level, and you normalize by the sum. Um, so if you're interested in just um, kind of a differential um, alternative axon usage or differential splicing, there's a great tool um, out there. It's called Splicing Compass. And they use the cosine distance measure and uh, combine with a kind of F test. So they compare the distances between the samples, between the groups, with the distances within the groups. And you can find differential um, um, uh, splicing. Um, just using distance measures. So that's an alternative to other um, um, packages out there that kind of infer the, the um, um, probabilistic um, um, kind of expression level of each isoform. Um, but here, you're not dependent on uh, the annotation. So it's not even known what kind of isoforms are present in each tissue. And you have axon level data. And from that, you're trying to infer the expression level of each uh, transcript. And that's a tough um, uh, project, in my opinion. So I mentioned that a different distance measure capture different uh, um, kind of biological aspects of your data. So imagine that um, for, one of, the, for all, uh, one of your samples, you double the expression level of the gene and of each axon. So what happens with this vector here? So it, all of a sudden, it becomes twice the length, right? But the angle doesn't change. Now, if, you, um, if you're interested in just splicing, and you don't want to be contaminated by differential expression, this is the distance measure that you should use. So this will just capture uh, alternative splicing, but it'll, it will be insensitive to just overall changes in expression level. On the other hand, 
if you have a situation where just this axon changes. So how do we capture this here? So just one axon changes. So then the angle will change, and so will the overall length. So the Canberra distance measure will capture both changes in splicing and in expression. OK, so now suppose that you compute your um, distance between all the samples according to some gene. So our goal is to produce like an adjacency matrix, and that's based on correlations. So now we are going to correlate kind of distances. So I will give you just like the classic example of like how do you go from like how do you generalize the concept of correlation. So imagine that you are in, um, in Europe and you find that there are similarities between um, you know, the languages that people, people speak and also the genetic makeup. So how do you relate that? And you also measure their um, kind of geographical distance. So now you, your hypothesis is that individuals that are in geographical proximity are also closer genetically. So now how do you test this hypothesis? So we'll generalize the concept of correlation. So here we are in Europe. You measure geographical distances, and you also uh, measure genetic differences. <clears throat> so you capture all that information in a square matrix. So here is the number of individuals that you sample, and you could produce a square matrix of all the pairwise differences. And now you have another um, distance matrix that captures the geographical uh, distances. So what you, what you do, you take all the unique distances which are below the diagonal and you put them in a vector and then you just use the um, Pearson correlation on this long vector. Um, it's also possible, it should be possible to use the bicorrelation, uh, but I haven't done that as of yet. So now let's get back to our uh, RNA-seq data set. So you have one gene, you measure the axon levels, you use the Canberra distance, and you produce this matrix for one gene. You repeat the process for all the genes that you included in your analysis. So now you end up with n genes. So here you have the samples, and here is how related they are according to, with this, particu to this particular gene. Now you have n matrices, and you just correlate them pairwise. So each gene gets correlated with every other gene. And at the end of the day, you have like your adjacency matrix. So here you have genes and genes. So all, uh, all the other steps are similar. So from now, you, you have your adjacency matrix. Everything else, it's the same, uh, just using WGCNA. <laughs> no need to reinvent the wheel, you know. <laughs> Just jump on the bandwagon. <laughs> okay, so now uh, I will go on and say that um, the cosine distance measure, remember, it's insensitive to situations where all axons change expression level uh, simultaneously. But it's, um, it's sensitive to changes in the ratio of um, relative axon usage. And once again, the Canberra distance measure is sensitive to both. So that means that we can com compute like two networks. So the first one is I call the co-splicing to reflect that it's just co-splicing. So you're not going to, to find um, any information about the co-expression unless you, you look at one axon genes. And why don't you use Euclidean? For simplicity, <laughs> because Canberra distance measure, I, I say, okay, this is, I compute the difference between two axons and I normalize by, the, um, by the, their sum. But a Euclidean, um, it's, it's probably giving you very similar results. Um, yeah. <laughs> So, yes. Uh, 
Um, no, it's not a differential network. Um, a differential network would be where um, it would be different. So in differential network analysis, you, you, you change, you dis, uh, do the difference between the correlations and uh, using, you cluster that, I, I, if that's my understanding. But he, The distances are between samples. So let's go back a little. OK. So I have here my gene, and it has three axons. The samples, um, so the samples could be from the same class, or it could be from different classes. So, so the, uh, the difference are between samples. So if you want to do differential axon usage, then you take these distances and do an F test. Okay. So there, um, this idea of using distance measures, it's, it's been around in um, in metabolomics and even in genetics. It actually started in 1967 where Mantel um, used it to cluster um, uh, cancer data according to different measurements. So then it took a life on its own in ecological, this um, uh, numerical ecology. So it's kind of a workhorse of numerical ecology to compute distances between um, samples or, uh, based on different um, characteristics. Um, and I would highly recommend you to, to kind of read a, a little bit the literature on numerical ecology because they have been analyzing kind of complex and dispersed data sets for decades. And they developed like really beautiful methods. And, uh, you know, I think we should move from the concept of like kind of like ecological landscape to kind of cellular landscape. And uh, I think you, utilizing distance measures is one way to get us there. So for instance, in, in metabolomics, um, they, do, they have a refinement on the Canberra distance measure. So imagine that you, you, me uh, you have the measurements for each peptide, or, um, and you want to find the differences between your samples. But you don't trust all the measurements equally. So then you, you kind of have a, a measure of how trustworthy is a particular peptide, or in our case, would be a, an axon. So then you can weigh your, your Canberra distance measure and say, OK, this is how much I trust you, and this is how much I'm going to include you in my uh, distance measure. So another application is like you have um, um, a protein, and then you measured it using like some very advanced technology, and you get like a three-dimensional object. So now you want to compare it. So how are you going to compare like a, a complex two complex objects. So the distance measures is like a well-developed um, methodology to, to um, kind of like get us to the point where we can compare complex data sets or complex three-dimensional objects. So let's suppose that a few years from now, you don't work on transcriptomics anymore. Um, you have some other you know, very complex type of data. And you, you look back and say, oh, wouldn't it be nice to use kind of this network uh, methods on this new type of uh, data that um, our lab has, um, you know, started to utilize. So for instance, like you have here high C data where you gather information about how like the, the chromosomes and the genome kind of folds on together and becomes uh, uh, from a I don't know, I think it's like about six feet long string, becomes like a tiny object. And it doesn't, it, it doesn't be, uh, become uh, knotted. So imagine the evolutionary process that gave rise to that really complex object. But what you have is information about the conformation of this uh, object. And people have been, have been describing them as um, you know, fractals or really complex objects that kind of have loops and um, they, they have 
very interesting uh, spatial properties. So that's your data. And you want to compare them because you notice that in disease, this object looks different. So how are you going to, to integrate all that data and maybe even use network methods on them? And I also believe that uh, using this kind of distance, distance measure approach is very useful for kind of a collaboration between uh, computational people and experimentalists. Um, because, you know, when we talk to kind of applied um, um, or bench um, biologists, it's very hard to explain all these concepts of like statistics and power and, and all this, you know, mathematical terminology. But what if we could just like say, okay, what do you believe that the most biological significant features of your data set are? So that's the question you should ask a biologist if you're a computational person. And then based on that, you design your distance measure. So that's, that's a very standard step. So you can repeat this for different data sets and in different circumstances. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time and choose different methods. And um, everything is kind of standardized except, except the construction of your distance measure. So back to our um, two good friends here. The Pearson correlation between the gene expression level is insignificant, but the mental correlation on the Canberra between sample distances is 0 0.76. And there are numerous examples of this, um, um, of this gene, of, of genes that have this kind of behavior. So how does it look when you uh, construct the co-splicing and you compare it with the co-expression and um, the, um, the other um, co-splicex network, which is based on the Canberra? So you can see the red one is the co-splicex, which is the Canberra distance measure, and the blue one is the co-expression, and the uh, green one is the co-splicing, which is the, uses the cosine distance. So you can see that you have scale independence and actually the cosplice X has faster convergence. The connectivity, they are comparable with uh, surprisingly the cosplicing appears a little bit more dense. Um, so these are um, a little bit similar measurements. Centralization, the cosplicing appear more centralized than the co-expression and heterogeneity, um, once again, uh, the cosplice X comes up on top. So the important point here is that yes, you do have um, scale-free structure in cosplicing networks. So now what I will do, I will compare the hubs in these networks. So I kind of, um, shape the data to, to emphasize some points. So I choose uh, the co-splicing hubs here. They, have, they are in top 20% of connectivity in the co-splicing network, but they are in the bottom 80% um, in the co-expression network. And here I have the co-expression uh, hubs. That, so these are hubs that are only co-expressed and they are not co-spliced. And these ones are hubs that are only co-spliced uh, but not co-expressed. And here actually is the Canberra distance, which captures both co-expression and co-splicing. Nevertheless, I want to emphasize that even the co-splice X, which uses the Canberra, has different properties than the co-expression hubs. So what do we find? So we find that the gene read counts, so everything is based on variability. So as expected, the, um, if you look at the gene read counts, so this is the gene level summarization, the co-expression co hubs are variable in that respect, um, while the co-splicing and the co-splice X have low variability, which is because I chose them so. 
but it's just, it's just to kind of visualize that we are based on variability, and there, there are different kinds of variability. There, you know, a gene can vary in its expression level, or it can just vary in the ratio of isoforms that it produces, and it's sometimes that's undetectable if you summarize the whole gene. So, exons per gene. So it turns out that the co-splicing hubs are basically very long genes with a lot of exons and a lot of annotated transcripts. Um, also, number of protein domains. So the, the proteins that are encoded by these genes uh, have a lot of domains, so that means that they are presumably capable of interacting with many other genes. And coding sequence size, the same story. So co-splicing hubs are long genes with many axons and many um, co um, um, annotated transcripts. And we'll go back uh, tomorrow to this uh, figure and show that um, there's interaction between uh, co-splicing and co-expression hubs, but that's only visible if you use the Canberra distance measure. So how does the annotation look for these genes? So remember, this is data from the uh, mouse striatum. So this is the, the, the figure, the slide, that kind of sold my method to my collaborators. <laughs> um, if you look at co-expression hubs, they are short genes, and they are involved in things that I would describe as kind of energy production. If you look at the co-splicing uh, co hubs, what do you see? Neurogenesis, synaptic gene, neuron differentiation. So it's, it was very striking. And that's because um, in the brain, all the, uh, a lot of the receptors and the synapses and even the axons, they are complicated uh, objects and they use like really um, a lot of long genes complicated structures, and I would argue that also they have a lot of isoforms. So if you look at the annotation of these genes, you will see the synaptic, and if you look at the Go and you collect all the genes that are involved in synapse, um, you will find that they are long, and with many axons and many uh, uh, annotated isoforms. Um, so the fact that they are long, it's kind of um, confounded or, or intersects with the fact that they are involved in uh, neuro, uh, neurophysiology. So what is known about long genes? Um, so this is a, a slew of recent papers that look at the length of a gene. Does that have any, any particular um, uh, relevance, especially in the brain, just because they are, they are long? So autism genes. They're all long. So that's not just um, um, you, um, kind of detected using transcriptional methods, because you might argue that, yes, you use RNA-seq data, and it's more sensitive to, to long genes that are highly expressed. So even if you use just uh, association studies, so the genes that pop up in autism um, using just like genetic markers, they're all long. and, and uh, that might be confounded by the fact that kind of genes active in the brain are long, but still. <laughs> the same story here. So gene length uh, in neurons. So, so there's, a, once again, a growing body of literature that uh, gene length and transcriptional mechanisms um, are very important in neurodevelopment. So here is some speculation of why that might be the case. So how long does it take to make a transcript? Um, if, if you're a long gene, it might take up to two days. So there's a lot going on in, in behavior, in animal behavior, in human behavior in two days. If you're a short gene, it takes minutes. So, you know, it. it it's very fast. Uh, there's no time for disruption from behavioral events. Um, so there's another um, kind of mechanisms that it's at play here. 
and I'm not a molecular biologist, so I can't go into too many details, but when uh, a cell divides, so there needs to be a copy of the DNA that's produced, and at the same time, maybe there's a transcription that needs to happen. So there are two different machineries that go along the same DNA, and one tries to copy the DNA, and one tries to transcribe the genes. What happens if they come head to head? That's called a collision. Um, until recently, it was thought that neurons don't divide, but we now know that in some cases they do. But generally speaking, like neurons don't divide that much. So that's kind of uh, one mechanism that is thought to be responsible for the bias towards long genes in neurons. They don't need to divide that much, so they can afford to have long genes. But if you have in some other um, you know, organ of the body that needs to divide a lot, that might not be the case. So not, now let's look at the evolutionary history of the hubs. So I looked um, from like yeast to humans. And this is kind of a rough order of complexity. So here, um, unfortunately, you cannot see the top of that. But basically, I look how many homologs are there for my co-expression hubs, for my co-splicing hubs, and for all the other genes in the network. So it turns out that the co-splicing hubs are more likely to be preserved or have homologs all the way back to yeast. And here I looked at um, unspliced transcript length. So you see like for the co-splicing hubs, you see that it's a tremendous increase in intronic length. And that's not true for all the genes. I mean, most of the genes, yes, they do increase a little bit, but nothing compares to the, co the genes that are co-spliced. Um, number of exons, the same story. But if you look at the coding leak, uh, sequence length, uh, you can go back all the way to yeast, and the homologs will pretty much have the same length. So what's going on here? So I can only speculate, but if you are, sti uh, if you are now all of a sudden you use the same gene to produce multiple isoforms, like something is, must be able to coordinate that process. So you, you need to have like some uh, you know, control machinery. So those might be splicing factors. They, they are the obvious candidates here. So they need to have binding sites. So they, my hypothesis here is that you have like these long introns because you need splicing binding sites where the machinery can kind of bind and control all of this complicated ratio of isoform production. But of course, this is just wild speculation based on, based on kind of computational results. So now what happens? Can I, can I find these splicing um, patterns or modules in uh, other species or other brain regions? First of all, I just went and I used the module quality um, um, kind of functionality in WGCNA. And I said, OK, are these real modules? And um, you know what? What is basic, their, their basic um, uh, properties? So if you look at the co-expression quality, I, I get very good co-expression quality. Uh, co-splicing quality is not quite as good as the co-expression, but still, you know, most of the modules have at least one measure of good quality. And if I use the co-splice X, which is the, once again the Canberra. Um, maybe the, the quality is a little bit better than the co-splicing. Still, at least each module has at least one measure of high quality. So, um, you know, maybe you can say that, okay, co-expression looks much better, and that's true. Still, this is uh, definitely not, um, uh, not too bad. Now, can I find this, the same modules in macaque? And this is uh, now in a different species and in a different brain region. Co-expression um, looks, looks OK. Like once again, almost every single uh, module has um, preservation above 2. Not, uh, not every single uh, measure is, is um, high, but still. The co-splicing looks a little better. And the co-splice X, once again, it's, it's um, you know, it's decent, I would say. 
And here is in the human cortex. So you see the same, um, you know, decent quality and preservation values. So in terms of preservation though, I think that it's fair to say that the cosplicing and the cosplicex have better preservation than the co-expression. Any questions? So we have about 20 million reads per sample in this data. So um, I, haven't, I haven't done that analysis. I didn't, so th for that I would have to subsample the data and say I'm just gonna use um, a little bit less um, and then see what happens. Um, but I haven't done that. So my prediction is that for, uh, for the most highly expressed genes, and especially for the long genes that you have lots of reads, you'll, you'll be robust. So as you go down, um, you'll start to lose, you'll start to lose kind of the, the genes that don't have a lot of reads. How deep do you have to sequence? You know, it's, it's really, I haven't done it, but it's kind of hard to tell. Um, so you have to look at the coefficient of variability. So you, you compute the distances, and um, then you look at the coefficient of variability of that particular gene. So if it's variable in terms of the, its distances, then I think it's worth um, going. And, and uh, if it's not variable, then definitely not. And uh, the next thing I would do, I would um, remove samples and just recompute uh, quantities based on fewer number of samples. So see if you find the same results. So you compute the distance measure based on some samples and then you recompute based on fewer samples and see is this a reliable result? What is the variability or in the... Uh, over here? Yes, I don't see the fact. So if A is the panel, A is one brain region, uh, panel okay. B is the uh, other. And what, what brain region did you use? Okay. I, I, I have a point, that's why I'm asking. Okay. I, your so um, my data comes from the mouse striatum. Um, so that's, that's, and here I have another data set that's human cortex, and yet another one that's macaque. So, and your, uh, Conclusion, there is no preservation or a high preservation? It's fairly high preservation. So I wonder, so the reason, if you use, for example, the association areas, if you compare human and macaques, because there is a, you know, it's a paper came out which show you expansion, the association areas related to Alzheimer's disease, maybe you are not seeing this kind of preservation and it's going to explain, mm -hmm. you know, this Evolutionary, um, you know, um, so the differences. Right. So. So do you understand that point I am I'm trying to make? So the reason why, because this area is evolutionary, very similar to each other. Mm -hmm. So if you are using uh, co comparing the association area, especially associated with Alzheimer's disease. Yes. 
So the question is um, that if you use um, different regions, yes. some of them more preserved in yes. across species, yes. then would you see this? Yes. So this is a more general question uh, about module preservation versus module differences. So it's, uh, my understanding is that you can have both module preservation and module disruption in the same data, and both will be uh, statistically significant. If you think of an organ across species, it's both preserved and altered. So the same way with a module. So you can, you can say, okay, it's the same module, and that's preservation, but also it's also disrupted. So there are different uh, methods to, to um, kind of evaluate this. So the mo for module preservation, you do here what I did here. You, you con detect your modules in the mice, and then you, you take the same module assignment, and I say, can I find it at a significant level in the, ma in the macaque and the human data? And that's a different question from taking uh, the same module in the humans, and one is from normal and one is from Alzheimer, and say, is this module disrupted? Maybe um, we'll discuss that later. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. but, sure. Um, do, you have, do you have other slides? Or are you done? Yeah. Uh, I have just some uh, summary slides. Okay, maybe we'll finish it and then we'll ask questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, so basically my conclusions, WGCNA can be used to construct consplicing and consplicex networks. And these are scale-free and comparable to co-expression networks. The distance measures are sensitive to different biological um, features. Co-splicing hubs are long genes, highly elongated ant uh, introns, and the modules are highly preserved across brain regions and species. And some future directions, um, maybe doing some, oh. <laughs> It's gone. <laughs> so future directions are really doing the downsampling, like it was suggested, and seeing how robust this is in different um, uh, statistical terms. Yes? Uh, your idea of having, um, being able to afford having long genes and neurons is mm -hmm. really interesting. Actually, all of this is interesting. It's stuff I've never thought about before. Um, would you, given that, would you expect that cells that have high turnover, um, such as like cells with lining the intestine that have turned Mm -hmm. would have generally an upregulation of short genes and downregulation of long genes. I guess what I'm wondering is how many of these long genes truly are neuronally specific, or are they more related to a lack of proliferation and turnover? Does that make sense? Yes. So the question is, like, um, are cells that are, um, have high turnover, uh, what do I expect to see there, right? So the colleague, um, depends how, um, how many collisions do you expect. So you can have long genes, but they might not produce many isoforms, right? Um, and you have to think about the collisions. Like, do, do you need to think about, like, okay, I have to divide the cell, I have to produce genes. So hard to tell. <laughs> so one thing that... Um Dave Gilbert's lab at Florida State studies DNA replication timing and mm -hmm. how the timing of when different segments of the genome are replicated in different cell lines. You can use that to identify um, cell features. Okay. Um, and so I'm also wondering about that in terms of cells that undergo rapid turnover versus most neurons that are post mitotic. Mm -hmm. um, and how, you know, if you're thinking about that collision, Maybe some of these cells are already geared that they don't have collisions because their replication is already orchestrated mm -hmm. in synchrony with how the genes are being transcribed. So is there another reason besides that? Like, are there other hypotheses that you could think of? I know it's a really <laughs> big sort of zoomed out question. Yeah, so, so the, the question is like, uh, what is the transcriptional machinery and the replication in, in different cell types, right? Um, so I don't think that this can give an answer to, to that general question. So, so this idea with the long genes and replication came from the autism groups. So I, I'll direct you to, to their um, uh, website and they have a long discussion about uh, collisions and why they happen more or less in neurons versus other cell types. Okay.
Oh, yes. Uh, okay, so can you repeat the question? I see, uh, okay, so the question is about single axon genes. So is this included in the analysis, right? Yes. Okay. So yes, so the, the only problem with single axon genes is in, when you compute the um, cosine distance because of, of obviously there is no angle between uh, one dimensional. So if over there for the co-splicing network, I just use the Canberra if there is a single axon gene. And um, the Canberra, it's um, apply, applicable to one dimensional data. So the one, one reason to, to use the Canberra is because we understand its properties. So if you have a seven axon gene, the distance will be between zero and seven. Um, and then if you, if you are saying that uh, for the cosine distance now, uh, do we understand its properties? So uh, over there it's more tricky because if you have a really small axon, you know, how much does that change the angle? So you have to be careful about how you use the, um, the distance measure and how you compute it. And also you have to be confident of your um, reliability of the measurements. So future direction is to say, okay, I, don't, I believe this axon is, is kind of noisy and it's slowly expressed and I want to weigh it like less. Okay, so the size, <laughs> yes. So the size of the modules, um, you know, I think that depends on what kind of biological um, question you're asking. Because I've seen uh, people use uh, hundreds of modules, and I've seen people uh, use, and myself, sometimes I use fewer. So it depends on the level of resolution that you're interested in. So that's a general question about you know, clustering and what, how many modules and what sizes you should get. So it's not specific to, to splicing. Um, so I, I use kind of the same, roughly the same size and number of modules in the co-expression versus co-splicing just for comparative purposes here. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank I'm you. Excited.